Staples is proud to produce the Raising Cannabis Capital podcast. Today's episode will begin after this brief message from our sponsor. This ain't no desk job, but it's what you got to do to scale up to this in a single growing season. It's how in Oregon alone, we grew and harvested the single largest crop of CBG in the world. Grit, tenacity, hell, whatever you want to call it, the crew at Hampton USA has it by the bucket load. Just getting our seeds in the ground back in spring and growing them till fall was nothing short of heroic. Propagation, planting, maintaining what we have, and building what we need. Trust me, this shit ain't easy. But when it comes to harvest time, our team bumps the bar up to a whole new level. Next comes processing. Everything but the top flower goes off to get turned into crude, distillate, isolate, and water-soluble ready. Our product, like our team, is nothing less than best in class. This plant has always had the power to change the world, but it needs people to make it happen. We're lucky to have those people right here at Hamptown, USA. digital media side is extremely limited. You're, you're not allowed for a variety of reasons to use most of those scalable options in the market like Google and Facebook and Instagram. From MJ Bulls Media, it's the Raising Cannabis Capital Show. on the MJ Bulls podcast. Hey, Dan. Thank you. Appreciate you uh, having us on today. Well, today we're with Eric Meth from his company, Good Harvest Co., a data-led cannabis audience platform and how investors can participate. But before we get to the Good Harvest story, Eric, let's talk a little bit about your career and what led you to cannabis. Sure, Dan. So I've always been involved in the consumer packaged goods, CPG industry, tied into retail, mainly from a marketing and advertising perspective for a good 25 years or so. I started early with print, consumer promotions, migrated over relatively early to digital media, uh, worked with large media companies like the New York Times and News Corp. But the last seven years had a, a responsibilities overseeing both consumer packaged goods and retailer, namely around data and working with that data to create more efficacy through advertising technology. When I looked at the cannabis industry, probably a good year ago or so, I really saw through a CPG marketer's lens. Uh, this is an industry that's growing rapidly. Uh, so looking at the, the similarities and the comparisons, I really wanted to take that, that great base of, of 25 years of, of career experience and apply it in a really thoughtful and purposeful mm -hmm. way to the cannabis industry. Well, I know mo most of our listeners understand the cannabis industry, but I don't think any of them completely can appreciate or understand why the marketing is so challenging. Can you tell our listeners why current cannabis conditions make marketing to customers in the cannabis industry so much harder than they are at, in other industries? The main challenge that exists right now, there's, there's a limited number of, of media options in the market that allow for brands to reach those cannabis shoppers and cannabis consumers. And the digital media side is extremely limited. You, you're, you're not allowed for a variety of reasons to use most of those scalable options in the market like Google and Facebook and Instagram. Paid search and, and social media also have a lot of limitations. Digital media that is available typically is very low quality. What we call mid-tail, long-tail sites, blog sites, don't really reach a huge concentration of, of desirable audience. And mobile options are very scarce too. And that's important when you're especially trying to target within specifically defined areas where cannabis is legal. So that's, that's yeah, really if, the, if there the, the limitation. If there was a way to overcome there. those cannabis limitations, what kind of opportunities would that create? Just obvious opportunities in those maybe the more unobvious opportunities for companies that could overcome these roadblocks? 
Sure. So, you know, I, I think the obvious ones, and, and all this is predicated on that last point, where, where Good Harvest Company is focused very specifically on leveraging that what we'll call cannabis shopper data. Uh, it's really the purest form of, of intent. While you can model behaviors through the way people browse websites or mobile devices, um, and you can mimic the, the, the traits of that audience, it's not super definitive. Whereas if you're taking data coming from the source and you're tying it back to an actual shopping and more so importantly, a, a, a buying behavior, that's really the purest form of intent. When you're putting down hard-earned money for a product, it's pretty obvious that you want that product. And when you start coupling that with Things like frequency, how often are you purchasing at location, again, which is extremely important uh, to adhere to advertising guidelines and uh, regulations. Um, it, it really becomes important to be able to focus on where those purchases are occurring, how often they're occurring, so you can paint a really vibrant picture of those consumers. And the obvious is for those brands to be able to take that, that highly targeted data and create more efficacy around digital media, make that data segments portable so they can activate it on uh, either websites or mobile devices or, or other forms of, of, of digital media channels that are out there. I'd say the non-obvious side is mainstream marketers. Uh, you, you have much larger budgets, specifically coming from uh, consumer packaged goods advertisers, quick serve restaurants, fast food restaurants, brands like Totino's Pizza Rolls, Brands like Uber and Lyft, uh, who want to avoid uh, consumers and have them avoid impaired driving, avoid the munchies. It's a trite example, but it lays potato chips, start getting into things like that. Uh, and this becomes another way that those marketers, again, can focus on those known consumers versus those assumed consumers. Before we got on, we talked about, you mentioned a little bit about the uh, an exchange, uh, mm -hmm. in, in which which I, was first I've, I've, I've heard of this and now, I don't know if we want to get super deep into this, but maybe you can just give everybody an overview of what you told me. Sure. Yeah, this is this is the part where it gets fun, where we can take all that rich data. The data has to go somewhere and it has to be, like I mentioned earlier, portable. Uh, and that's where the notion of media exchanges come in. That was a large part of, of the last seven years of my career. If you think of media exchanges like the stock market, Instead of stocks, you're basically trading inventory. And that inventory could be on a website, it could be on a mobile device, it could be a streaming audio ad on Pandora. Every publisher has additional inventory that they need to sell. If they have their own sales team, they're most likely not selling all of their inventory. If they don't have a sales team, they're relying on these exchanges to have brands access that inventory, much like stocks. If you, th you think about a buyer set, and a seller set, that's where the exchanges come in. It's, it's effectively creating a marketplace so buyers can be connected with those sellers that are selling that inventory on these open marketplaces. And a bidding process starts happening at that point. That's where the value around that inventory becomes created. You can do a lot of interesting targeting. Op There's a lot of targeting opportunities that you can take advantage of within these exchanges. Some of the exchanges have data on hand. Some of them allow brands to bring their own data to the table. This is meeting in the middle where Good Harvest will be essentially interacting with those exchanges. We're a data management platform at the end of the day. Integration within those types of exchanges allows for those marketers to add on that extra piece of data tied to those shopping behaviors. So instead of just reaching every single cannabis consumer that resides in the state of Nevada, we could focus our efforts just on specific counties or zip codes based on those known buying behaviors by layering on a data component. There's extra cost to it per thousand in the media world, the CPM. We have the ability to leverage up those CPMs. So it's better for the, the, the brand at the end of the day while they're spending more, their targeting efficacy is increasing and, and the results uh, in turn increase as well. And that's what Good Harvest Company is, is going to bring to the table. Can you explain to us exactly how your company will do that? Sure. So it starts with those owners of the data. It, it's critical. And one of the one of the main components that, that we're laser focused on is purposeful use of that data and really paying strict attention to not exposing any kind of personal information off of that. The targeting opportunities come through not so much the person who's making the purchase, but the device that's activating that purchase. There's a lot of retailers who are putting their inventory online, make it easier for their consumers to shop before they come into the store. Um, they might shop, they might purchase online. 
if they're in a legal state, uh, and then have that either delivered through a service or they might have a express lane pickup uh, in addition to coming into the store day in and day out. For those types of consumers, that's where we're starting. We're starting with those consumers that are interacting through those desktop e-commerce platforms that are being used by the retailers or they're browsing on their mobile device. There's anonymous data that can be collected, which isn't exposing any kind of personal information about that user. It's allowing the personal information to be kept by the data owner, which is the retailer. Retailer 100% owns you as a consumer by virtue of you transacting with them. So by taking those devices and matching the buying and shopping behaviors against the device, we can match that device. If I'm a shopper and I go on, let's just say, Green Dragon's mobile site before I go in and purchase at their store, one of their store locations in Colorado, they've got identity against my iPhone. My iPhone can then be targeted wherever I may be. I may be on an app, I may be on a mobile website, but that ID is then being triggered and a brand can effectively reach me as the device and me behind the device as the ideal consumer who purchased an Edibles product at Green Dragon. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. That is really, great stuff. Yeah, that's really great stuff. <laughs> I want to take a minute to tell you about some really innovative things that our sponsor Cream of the Crop is doing in the cannabis space. Their brand is on fire. They have the fifth best-selling indoor flower brand in the state and they're profitable, growing their business at 10% a month year to date. They're succeeding by helping cultivators turn profits through operation management and consulting in exchange for supply agreements. By bringing 30 plus years of cultivation experience, award-winning genetics, ultra-efficient SOPs, proprietary nutrient mixes, and their brand, they're able to help both operators who are new to the space and ones who want to just increase efficiency. In fact, they just increased profits for one of their clients by $700,000 per month. Just incredible. But what's really exciting is that they're expanding their highly scalable model beyond California. That's right, they're accepting applications across the country for 2021 and 2022 partnerships. Also, if you're planning to invest in cannabis, you should definitely look at Cream of the Crop because they're doing a capital round in early 2021 to help with their brand's national expansion. To learn more about partnering with Cream of the Crop or investing in their expansion, go to creamofthecropgardens.com. That's creamofthecropgardens.com. Tell us how investors could get involved with your company. Perfect. So right now, full, full startup, pre-revenue mode. We've got a seed round in play. Structured everything under a convertible note. It's a target raise of $1.5 million. We've got a 20% discount on a follow-up round uh, with a $5 million valuation cap. The trigger against that cap is, is $1.5 million on a follow-on round. I've broken the raise basically into three tranches of a half a million each. So right now we're in phase one. We've got about 60% of that raised to date. We're looking to close that by the end of 2018 to continue working on our uh, minimum viable product or MVP or prototype. That allows us to get to phase two, which would include a beta launch, bring in some first revenue, test clients in the first half of 2019, and then tranche three, really focus on the end of 2019, where we start showing some traction, some monthly recurring revenue projections to annual recurring revenue. But we, we see this as a solid opportunity to become driving about a million in short-term revenue within the first year of operation, seeing anywhere between 30 to 50 million between the, the first three to four years with really healthy margins attached to it. Once we have that that base built, a lot of the investment cost is really on the technology side. Uh, that technology becomes a lot more scalable, particularly as more markets start coming online. Regardless, we're seeing that trend where more states are getting on board, Canada coming obviously on board full on in the next month or so. And that's where we see more of the opportunity, more sales lead to more needs for marketing and partitioning the total sales against that market. And that's where we're, we're doing those those forecast against. Well, Eric Meth is the CEO of Good Harvest Co., which is a data-led cannabis audience platform. And all of Good Harvest information is on the MJ Bulls website at mjbulls.com, including their pitch deck, which you really should look at because it takes a fairly technical business and makes it understandable. It also lists everyone that's on their advisory team, which, by the way, is very impressive. So if you have a chance, go to the, the MJ Bulls website and check out their pitch deck. Really makes a complicated or a technical business n not so technical. Eric, thanks for being with us on the MJ Bulls podcast. Thank you, Dan. It's been great. Appreciate the time and look forward to uh, seeing the response and happy to answer any questions. If you want to reach me, invest at goodharvest.co uh, and that'll, that message will find its way to me. Appreciate the time. Thank you.
Crappy's Feel Better Company is a cannabinoid CBG company with a line of easy-to-use CBG, CBD, and CBN products built for the weekend warriors, the weekday Zoomers, and anyone in between. Crappy's next-gen products incorporate pharmaceutical-derived chemistry to precisely blend minor cannabinoids and terpenes, creating a series of proprietary formulas for hyper-targeted use cases. Harnessing a team of experts with over 75 combined years of chemistry experience, the company relies on its novel solubility technology, state-of-the-art delivery, consistent results, and unique eye-catching branding to stand out from the crowd. Crappy's executive team and chemists have created a vast and diverse product pipeline to maintain relevance in a saturated market. To find out how you can participate in Crappy's Feel Better expansion, which includes major retail placements, university-executed clinical trials, IP and patent submissions, GMP and API scale-up, and international distribution? Go to crappiesfeelbetter.com or on Instagram at crappiesfeelbetter. Today's show was made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, like Alt36, the country's premier blockchain payment processing platform that's providing dispensaries and its customers with a safe and secure payment option other than cash. To learn more, go to alt36.com. 